Good evening, and welcome to part five of our series, Unstoppable, a journey through the book of Acts. Over the past four weeks, we stressed that when the Christian church was formed after Pentecost, God unleashed the Holy Spirit to work in and through his people to accomplish his mission to save the world. Now, as we move through this series, we will continually see that God's Spirit really is unstoppable, as he is forever moving in power to accomplish God the Father's will. We believe that this series should encourage us to see that the apparently impossible task of spreading the gospel of Jesus throughout our local community is actually possible. But as I said last week, this series challenges us to decide whether we want to be part of this unstoppable movement or whether we're content to stand on the sidelines. The ongoing question that arises throughout this series is do we dare to be the church God had in mind from its formation in Acts chapter 2? The book of Acts tells us the story of an ongoing battle between God and Satan as to the future of this world. In many ways, this battle is reminiscent of a series of challenge matches between two great grandmasters of chess, with God being represented by the white pieces and Satan represented by the black pieces. For each move either player makes, the other counters. And we know, unlike chess, neither side will ever admit defeat by resigning. The good news for us is that we know God must win in the end. But his opponent doesn't seem to know that and won't go down without a fight. Now last week, we saw how an apparently minor dispute between the two wings of the Christian church failed to split the church apart as Satan had intended and instead resulted in the apostles delegating some of their work to seven men known to be full of spirit and wisdom. Prominent among the seven are Stephen and Philip. And as we saw last week, Stephen's ministry exploded and expanded beyond overseeing the care of widows, to the powerful proclamation of the gospel, accompanied with signs and wonders. This ministry led to opposition, which ultimately led to his execution. And so we move into our first reading from Acts chapter 8, verses 1 to 3. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. Now as we move into chapter 8, we see that with Stephen's death, Satan launched a massive new offensive as intensive persecution broke out against the church, which caused the saints to scatter. And we read that all but the apostles fled. Only the apostles stayed behind in Jerusalem. Satan's intention was to smash the church into tiny pieces, to render it ineffective. God's response was to use the breakup of the church to begin a massive missionary expansion. Notice which remarkably happened without the leadership and presence of the apostles, but through the unstoppable power of the Holy Spirit. God's promise given in Acts 1 verse 8, that you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth, was now being fulfilled in Acts 8 verse 1, but not in the way perhaps we would have expected. Can you see that the evangelism to the Samaritans and the Gentiles did not take place because men actively sought to obey the command of our Lord expressed in the Great Commission, but was brought about by the sovereign head of the church himself through persecution? 
And so the saints went about sharing the gospel, not so much out of obedience, but out of necessity. God countered Satan's intention by turning persecution into a means of spreading the gospel far and wide. Can you see we underestimate God at our peril? If we leave God out of our planning, we won't succeed. But be reassured, the spread of the gospel in this area doesn't rely on our careful planning, but rather through us being in tune with the unstoppable Holy Spirit. And that brings us to our second reading from Acts chapter 8, as we meet Philip in verses 4 to 8. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. For with shrieks, impure spirits came out of many, and many who were paralysed or lame were healed. So there was great joy in that city. In the next section, we meet Philip, one of the seven, who had arrived in the city of Samaria as a result of the persecution of the church and the scattering of the saints. Can you see how this scattering occurs exactly in the order specified in God's promise earlier in Acts? And you should be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. And so the church had been born in Jerusalem as we've read in chapters 1 to 7. It spread through persecution to Judea in chapter 8 and then abroad as we will see in the later chapters of the book of Acts. Those who were scattered may have fled Jerusalem in fear but it didn't suppress the message of the gospel being proclaimed wherever they went. Notice that these saints didn't simply proclaim the gospel out of duty, but rather shared it willingly as a truth that burned within them, a truth that simply couldn't be bottled up, as they were continually inspired by the promptings of the Holy Spirit. And as they got to know their new neighbours, they felt compelled to speak of the Messiah, and Jesus' message of love, forgiveness and salvation. It simply was too important for them to remain silent for long. We are not told how or why Philip ended up in the city of Samaria. We can safely assume that Philip left Jerusalem because of the intense persecution that arose following the death of Stephen. We are not told that Philip was divinely directed to this city. The impression we get from this passage is that he simply ended up there. Like Stephen, the hand of God was powerfully evident in Philip's ministry. As we read, great signs accompanied and underscored his preaching, so that the people gave attention to his message. Among the miracles which occurred were the exorcism of demons and the healing of the paralyzed. As God's power was demonstrated, and the gospel was received. There was great joy in the city. The Samaritan revival had really begun. And that leads us into our third reading, from Acts 8, verses 26 to 40, when we encounter Philip and the Ethiopian. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Kandake, which means Queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you are reading? Philip asked. How can I? he said, unless someone explains to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. This is the passage of scripture the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearer is silent, 
so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, Please tell me, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they travelled along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What can stand in the way of my being baptised? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and Philip baptised him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared at Azotus and travelled about preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. Earlier, we said that Philip didn't appear to have been directed specifically to Samaria, where God enabled him to share the gospel with many people. But now in contrast, in this passage, we are very clearly told that Philip was specifically directed to the Ethiopian and to this meeting place in a remote location in the desert. It was clearly a divine appointment for a very specific reason. There can be no mistake in this. Here God intended to save this one man, an Ethiopian, a high government official and a eunuch. Notice that the Ethiopian was returning from Jerusalem. No doubt he'd been to worship God in the temple. If this was the eunuch's first pilgrimage to the Holy Land, undoubtedly he'd have many questions. Or if the Ethiopian had been to Jerusalem before, he would certainly have heard of Jesus, of his claim to be the Messiah, of his ministry, his rejection, his trial, his death and burial, and most likely about the empty tomb. He may have even heard of the apostles, of their radical change after the death of Jesus, and of their ministry and their message. But most definitely, at the time of the Ethiopians' arrival in Jerusalem, the headline news would have been Stephen's ministry and martyrdom, and the widespread persecution of the church led, at least in part, by a Jew called Saul. It seems that the eunuch had strong commitment to Judaism as his pilgrimage to Jerusalem would not have been easy and would definitely have been expensive. Now it also appears that he has a strong sense of messianic expectation and that no doubt meant he would have asked about Jesus. Perhaps it was this that prompted him to look into the scriptures to see for himself what the Old Testament prophets had actually written. Perhaps the Ethiopian purchased this copy of the Isaiah scroll so that he could read the prophecies about the Messiah. Perhaps the Ethiopian had been looking into the scriptures for some time and was now ready to receive Philip's explanation of these scriptures. How reassuring it must have been for Philip to hear the Ethiopian reading aloud from the prophecy of Isaiah. There was no doubt about it. Here was the man Philip had been sent to meet. When Philip ran alongside the Ethiopian's chariot and asked if he understood what he was reading, the Ethiopian quickly accepted his help. He needed, as he said, someone to guide him through the prophecies contained in the Old Testament concerning things to come. In contrast, we know the Gospel tells us of how these prophecies have been fulfilled in Jesus. The prophecy which the Ethiopian was reading included these words, which simply baffled him. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before the shearer is silent, so he does not open his mouth. In humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? for his life was taken from the earth. Now Philip was about to tell the Ethiopian that the prophecies of Isaiah concerning the Messiah were fulfilled in the person of Jesus. 
And so Philip began with this text, proclaiming Jesus to be the Messiah. Although these words came from Isaiah 53 verse 7 and 8, I think we can safely assume that the Ethiopian had read the entire text and so was well aware of the overall passage and of its context. The problem the Ethiopian had with this passage was wrapped up in the identity of the one referred to in the text. As he says, tell me please, who is the prophet talking about himself? or someone else. Perhaps the Ethiopian had asked the same question in Jerusalem and hadn't received a satisfactory explanation. After all, the previous verses make it clear that Isaiah was not referring to himself, and so he must be referring to another. And who else could that be, other than the Messiah? But if it was the Messiah, he was not the kind of Messiah that Israel was looking for. They were looking for a superhero to rid Israel of her oppressors, not a suffering servant. We, of course, can see that this description perfectly portrays the coming of Jesus and his rejection by Israel. No wonder the identity of the one mentioned is so important to the Ethiopian. Philip's answer was to proclaim Jesus as the Messiah, beginning with this text and then from the rest of the Old Testament. The Ethiopian joyfully accepted Philip's words. When he saw water, truly a rare thing in this desert place, he saw this as a God-given opportunity. He wanted to be baptised. We don't know for sure who told the Ethiopian of the need for baptism. But he was right in seeing it as an important step for a true believer. When the chariot stopped, both got out, and Philip baptised him. And then, even more quickly than he'd appeared on the scene, Philip disappeared. This is a significant moment in the spread of the gospel. As Philip's identification of the one on whom Isaiah wrote as being Jesus confirmed for the first time that Isaiah 53 is clearly a messianic prophecy. This would not have been received or welcomed as such by those within Judaism who still wait for a very different kind of Messiah. The conversion of the Ethiopian was a very significant event recorded during the Great Samaritan Revival. The Samaritans were regarded as half-brothers to the Israelites. Although not liked, they shared the same ancestry. We know from John 4 that they'd even been included in Jesus' ministry as we read that many of the Samaritans believed in Jesus because of his meeting with the woman at the well. In contrast, this Ethiopian was a kind of first fruit of the Gentiles. His race, along with his physical deformity, would have kept him from approaching God. But God approached him, seeking him out in the desert, making it clear that he was a true saint and the first of many more to come. The Ethiopian was first brought near to God by faith in Jesus as the Christ. But significantly, he was not saved through the ministry of the Apostle, but rather through Philip, acting under the direction of the Holy Spirit. Unlike Philip, the Ethiopian proceeded back to his native land in a more conventional way. We are not told any more of this man in the New Testament. Although some ancients viewed this man as the father of evangelism in Ethiopia, what we're told is this man went on his way rejoicing. Now in conclusion, Acts is the story of God's unstoppable spirit working through God's people to accomplish God's mission. The good news of today's encounter is that God can use ordinary people to perform extraordinary acts. God can use ordinary people to spread the gospel in an area such as Samaria, such as Aldrich and Rose Green. God uses ordinary people as a catalyst for even more extraordinary events as the gospel continues to spread outwards. But sometimes God sets up divine appointments for ordinary people to share the gospel with a specific person, someone you may know already, or perhaps a total stranger. God uses ordinary people just like you and just like me to accomplish his mission 
Are you really aware that God wants to use you? Yes, you. Just the thought of it is probably enough for you to think of all the reasons why God couldn't possibly want to use you. But the good news is that while you are still breathing, God has a plan and he wants you to be part of it. If we are going to experience God to the fullest, to being used by him for his glory, we have to get on board with his plan to save the world. The Spirit of God can move and work anywhere, in any location, at work, at play, in the streets. The Spirit of God really is unstoppable. However, he has not been sent to help you accomplish your personal goals. He's been sent to empower you to live on mission. So if you want to experience his power, we really have to understand that as part of his church, we are also part of his mission to spread the gospel. And so what lessons can we take for our lives in Philip's response to the Spirit's prompting? Remember, Philip was already engaged in a highly successful evangelistic crusade in Samaria when the Lord instructed him to go south to the desert road that ran from Jerusalem to Gaza. Faithful Philip arose and went. Notice, no arguing, no moaning, no discussion. He simply made himself available. So lesson one is we must make ourselves available at all times when called by the Holy Spirit. Now, on the road, he encountered an Ethiopian statesman travelling home from Jerusalem, and the Spirit of God prompted Philip to approach the traveller. He sensed that God was clearly opening the door. Philip was led by the Spirit, and this is lesson two. We must be in tune with the Holy Spirit at all times. Notice that Philip cooperated in obedience. So lesson three is we must be obedient to the promptings of the Holy Spirit. Philip heard the man reading Isaiah aloud and asked, do you understand what you're reading? Notice Philip didn't barge in and start preaching. So lesson four is we must wait for a proper opening and that is really important. The Ethiopian invited Philip to sit with him and assist him in his understanding. Philip responded with great tactfulness. And this is lesson five. We must be tactful, not go in like a bull in the china shop. Notice that even though Philip had his foot in the door, he remained sensitive as to when he should speak of salvation. When the moment came, he spoke clearly and became specific. No vague dialogue about religion. He spoke only of the Saviour, the main issue. And this is lesson six. We must be specific at the right moment. The last verses then describe the follow-up Philip employed. In response to the Ethiopian's request, Philip baptised him. This is lesson seven. Always follow up with an appropriate reaction. This could be an invitation to talk further, or to meet other Christians in a home group, or to meet Simon, or to come to church, and so on. Over the last 15 months, as we've lived through this pandemic, Everyone has had more time to reflect on life and death. Many will have realised that the certainties they once held on to are not quite as secure as perhaps they once thought. I'm sure lots of people, but especially non-Christians, have asked, do you have any idea what's gone wrong in the world? Or perhaps even, where is God in this? This Ethiopian represents some of these people. People who perhaps used to go to church, who used to read the Bible. People who once sought out the truth, yet never personally experienced the saving grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. They were sincere in their searching, but they are lost. They need someone to show them the way, and that someone could be you. If evangelizing the lost, especially those who are not like you, depended on our abilities, it would be hopeless. But thankfully, evangelism depends on our sovereign God working through our obedience. The same Holy Spirit who used Philip to reach the Ethiopian and who used Spurgeon to reach thousands, who used Billy Graham on his gospel crusades, wants to use you and me to bring the good news of Jesus Christ to Rose Green, Aldrich and beyond. 
with the saints of old. Let's obediently expect great things from God and attempt great things for God as we take the gospel into a lost world, remembering always that God uses the ordinary to achieve the extraordinary.